This is the Insomniacs Anonymous Podcast, handcrafted with 31 flavors of dicks. Today on the podcast, we talk about Nintendo's second mobile game, Super Mario Run, and Pokemon Sun and Moon, which was released today. Go get it now. We talk about Guild Wars 2's World v. World proposals and what the community thinks of them so far. And I playing D&D for a podcast? It's more likely than you think. Stick around, the fun's about to begin. Are you ready? We're ready, Captain! I can't hear you. We're ready, Captain! Oh, ow. ow. <laughs> what did you do? I can't hold the raspy voice, damn it. Uh. Oh, oh, lives in a pineapple under the sea. I a podcast. Well, that doesn't really work. <laughs> it kind of does. It's the it's the same. Uh, yeah, I guess if you add story. the podcast, it kind of does. Okay, let's do this for real. That wasn't real. Damn. Oh, okay, we can make it real. Hello, everybody. My name is Dude. Welcome to the I a podcast. I am joined by my good friend Shro. Woo. I was going to interrupt you like Brian did last week, and then you went off on a di- completely different... I'm like, no, nope, I'm going to let this one go. Okay. Uh, it is episode 26, November 15th. I almost said 18th. Fuck. And... Right, I thought thought it was uh, episode 26, November 26th. <laughs> when I, I read it because my brain was just nah. like, dyslexia! Wee! Nah, man. It's not Thanksgiving yet. Yeah, I'd be late for Black Friday if that was happening. Uh, yeah, Thanksgiving is around the corner, so you have a plan there, Shro. Well, my sister's coming back from her uh, PhD thing, so that'll probably be entertaining and, you know, bang head against wall at the same time. But Why? Um, because my family. Oh. And, You're going to uh, rub the PhD in your face, huh? Yeah, it usually happens. Uh huh. Um, no, actually, me and my sister, as far as siblings go, get along really well, but we, you know, we still have sibling rivalry, but we don't, like, hate each other like a lot of siblings do. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Especially since her and I see eye to eye on a lot more things than we see eye to eye with either of our parents on things. So, there is a generational gap there, but, um, That's but no, cool. that, that should be entertaining. Um, but then, of course, <clears throat> I pretty much always go to Black Friday, even on days that I can't actually, or years that I can't actually buy anything. It's like, ooh, I'll go to Black Friday at this really awesome computer store and buy a candy bar at the, the cash register. Because, yeah. Well, cheaper candy bars, planet. that's good. No, no. Oh, really? They're not cheap. Doesn't... Yeah. Black wow. Friday isn't a blanket discount on everything, it's just a, a discount on a lot of things. Mm. So, I am actually hoping um, my friend that I've been helping with his car all summer, which I'm now actually... Not only am I happy that it's done, um, but I I now have to do a lot of work on my own car that I was planning on doing in the summer, and instead spent all summer long on his car. So, like, now that it's getting cold again, and, like, the peak highs are 60 degrees, if that, I'm like, great... (laughs) <laughs> get to do all this shit in the driveway as their wind chill is like 40 fun <laughs> at least it's not like blistering hot and you're out there dying yeah though that does make changing oil a little easier mm. I digress um, so yeah no apparently that car is being sold tonight if everything goes according to plan that I worked on so that's interesting Hope you see a cut of that money. In a way, I do. All the work you I, did on it. I mean, he's compensated me with numerous uh, adult beverages and meals. Um, I got a monitor stand that is super awesome for one of my monitors. I actually basically have free reign over his second one because he doesn't use that one anymore either. But uh, I literally have nowhere to put it right now. So. Uh. <laughs> still in his basement and yeah there's other compensation that we're working out as far as like either 
He might get me a gift card to set the awesome computer store or just straight up cash or some other weirdness. But yeah, That's we're making good. it work. So, and I, I, I learned a lot and I also, uh, learned to choose my nightmare battles a little more carefully because holy fuck. <laughs> If I ever have to paint a car 12 times in the same spot again, I'm just blowing God. my brains out. <laughs> that sounds like hell. It, 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 it was a very strange slice of hell. Because I had to learn through experience and references and lots of online studying basically, on the do's and don'ts of trying to do this kind of paint repair. Because the paint I was using isn't really meant to be sanded, but I didn't really figure that out until, like, pass number seven. Because normally, if you paint something in layers, and even when you don't paint in layers, but you, you want to do, like, light sanding over a paint job, especially if it was sprayed on, or even more so if it was brushed, because you know it if you don't it still leaves a really rough surface so you have to sand it even though it seems counterintuitive at first to think that you you want to take something sanding and rough it up but that's what you do only then you use a really 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 fine grit sandpaper so it actually polishes it it's but uh yeah hmm. the paint the paint that i was using that is available to consumers and is the de facto go-to because we are not manufacturers of cars and don't have the right paint. Um, yeah. It just really doesn't hand up, handle sandpaper very well. So I would put it on and then I'd go to sand it and it'd come right back off. So then I'd have to put it on again. And it was just a vicious cycle. <laughs> and then I went to a body shop and like, look, I'm doing this, and everything I've read and studied says I should be able to do this, and I paint and done models and various other painting and all this on stuff, and then and this normally works. It's not like I've been a stranger to paint. Well, why isn't this working? Oh, yeah, no, we couldn't even do that. Th those, those paints aren't meant for that, and even our paints aren't really meant to work like that. And I'm like, oh, oh I wish well, someone shit. had told me that sooner <laughs> before I wasted <laughs> two months of my life on this. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. So, but yeah, theoretically, that is uh, being removed from my possibility pool, not only because we finally pretty much finished it. We had to, like, wax and polish his car still, and he forgot about that after having a few days where we couldn't get together. Like, we, no, I can't meet today. And then, oh, I can't meet the other day. So that went on for like two weeks, and then I guess he forgot, and I asked him, like, look, are we ever going to finish, like, waxing and polishing your car since we finally got all the paint shit figured out? Oh, I forgot about that. Um, I guess I'll just take it to a car wash, because I kind of want to be done with this. I'm like, I'm okay with that idea. <laughs> and then so, it was over. Yep, and I guess he's selling it, so. Cool beans. He's wanted to sell that thing for a while now, and then somebody keyed it, and so that was like his... Oh, shit. His break... Yeah, that's why I was drafted into all this, is because somebody keyed it. And let this be a lesson to you listeners. Somebody keyed his car because he apparently got to a parking spot sooner than somebody else that thought they were going to get that parking spot in a Walmart parking lot. So don't go to Walmart. Well, there's that, but no. Think about it. It's Walmart. There go, are go eight Walmart. bajillion cameras pointed at the parking lot in a Walmart because it's Walmart. He had every right and cause to basically go file vandalism police report, police pull security footage, police go, yeah, that bitch that walked out of that car keyed his car. Okay. Track down license plate, press charges. Congratulations. All the damage done to your car can now be professionally done by a uh, um, body shop in repairs because the idiot that did it, it now has to pay for it as, you know, criminal compensation. 
Or the simpler solution, don't go to Walmart. Well, my point here is, is if somebody keys your cart, press charges, you fucking idiot. Uh, yeah. He was moving at that point, and so he's like, I'm doing too much. And I'm like, it takes you like an hour to go to the freaking police station and go, somebody keyed my cart at Walmart at this time. I have the receipt that proves I was there at this time. Can you please go find who did it? And so I can press vandalism charges. No, I'm too busy. Mm, too lazy is the thing. I'd just rather not well, go to Walmart. He's like the non-confrontational type of person. Oh. So, like, I, 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 I'm either convinced it was really he didn't want to put forth the social effort on it, even if he. I mean, I just, I, I can't fathom. Maybe, maybe in his mind it works, but I can't fathom the I was moving and so I was too busy concept but meh um either that or i wasn't there so maybe he did something worse and doesn't want to admit it <laughs> and that's why you still shouldn't key somebody's car but yeah and for those of you wondering why because it's just paint well the paint protects the metal on the car and if you key somebody's car you remove the protection and so, in doing so, you basically open up the car to rust. And if you do that, it rusts that spot, and then the rust is now under the paint and can rust out the entire car, even with that little scratch. That's why it's called car cancer. I guess cancer for metal, in general. It, it quite that literally is, is. I've heard that as boat cancer, too. And yeah, again, that it's was really any sort of metal yeah. kind of structure. Because you can't really stop the oxidation process that is rusting once it starts. You can only try to prevent it. Mm. So, yeah, one, it, once it goes, it, it's like terminal cancer. It just It's Dang. just a ticking clock at that point. The only, the only other way you can do it is to, much like trying to excise a tumor from somebody, is to literally cut out the entire infected section of metal before it gets to other things. But obviously, whether it's just a scratch on paint or an entire rusted out section, it becomes an incredible amount of money for a body shop to repair it because to actually repair a scratch appropriately, you have to strip the paint off of the entire affected body panel and repaint the whole body panel with exact matching and aged paint which is extraordinarily hard to get because <laughs> you'd have to do color mixing like the, one of the problems we had is we had paint that was like touch up paint matched for his car but his car is eight to nine years old and so the weathering of the sun and just age and driving it around everywhere in the elements actually tints the paint over time so the actual existing coat on the car is different than the brand new paint from the same batch huh so it actually part of the annoyance that i had when i was doing this is that i was painting the basically painting the scratch in and filling it in and while the paint was there and did its job of filling in the gap, it was a different color. So, yeah. Anyways, enough car talk. Let's move on. Yes. Anyway, uh, so what's new in the World v. World business? You seem to have a lot going for that. Oh, boy. Um, well, so I found two articles. I was thinking of linking them, but they're probably not that big of a deal. Um to link. I'll just discuss them. Basically, uh, if you've been playing uh, World vs. World in the last several months or so, maybe longer, um, they've done something called Linked Worlds, where mm -hmm. instead of just a... There were 24 worlds and three-way matchups, so you had eight tiers in the uh, North American server system. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is that the tier one servers are extremely populated to the point of being full most of the time until they changed a few things. 
So nobody could transfer into those servers. You could only transfer out. It also means that with that many freaking people playing in World vs. World, you basically have 24-hour coverage each day during the week, which is really important when the game never stops existing. So you have just different time zones of people playing throughout the day. So when you get into the lower tiers, you get less people playing and you get less coverage over certain time zones. So there can be times where like, it's especially prevalent for like the Asiatic time zones, Oceanic and Sea, uh, Australia too, that if you're playing during the normal evening gaming hours for the average person in the North American servers, that there are very few other people playing at those time zones when you're in some of the lower, you know, like tier four, five, six, and so on. So part of the way ANET tried to compensate for that is to take worlds that had less people playing, a lower population, mm -hmm. and combine them. They didn't do actual combining of the servers and, like, call it a new server, but they basically said, like, Eridon Terrace and Yaks Bend, you're going to be a new group together. You're a team now, basically. Oh, so they're just teaming up lower populated servers with higher populated servers and that's it right and in some cases three so like there's oh. uh one i can't even remember right now what the mix is but there's three small servers uh or rather two small servers and a medium server combined as a three group or three server team and they're now a single team in a three-way world versus world matchup and the whole goal of this, and it has kind of worked, actually, um, is that they can level out the playing field a little bit and have it so that, you know, these groups of two or three team server or two or three server teams actually can fight against something like Blackgate or Jade Quarry that are just are super ridiculously super heavy good. populated. Yeah. So, but the problem is, is that the math doesn't quite work out. So their example shows, uh, let me give numbers. I don't know if this is actual numbers, but their example says like, let's say world one has 95% full population. The next world is 82%, then 81, 60, 30, and 10%. Even if you take the smallest world to put it with the biggest world and then worked up towards the middle of the list, you end up with the totals that reach worlds one and six being 105 total percent together, worlds two and five being 112 percent together, and worlds three and four being 141 percent together because two medium worlds together is still bigger than the big world and a small world. So basically, the problem hasn't really gone away. It's just been changed a little bit. Sure, the disparity of, you know, 95% to 10% isn't there anymore, but you still have a serious gap. So they've decided that they're tossing around the idea. They haven't said they're even going to attempt it, but they're tossing around the idea of splitting servers into new servers. So that they have, like, take Fort Aspenwood, and now there's Fort Aspenwood A and B. And then you have two smaller worlds. And if, think of it like resolution. If you have more of something smaller, you can put something together to get closer to that 100% number more accurately. Again, the math is, it's a little mathy on this, but if you had... Instead of an 85% full server and you split it and had two 80 or two 42% servers, then you can combine those with other things and make it a lot easier to get to 100% than to have that overblow of like 141% or have somebody at like 60% still. 
So that's the idea. And they're proposing that um, if you we had, it would basically be twice as many worlds. So now instead of 24, there'd be like almost 40, 42. And then the other option is to then you have to populate these worlds somehow. So they'd be offering free transfers for people. So that's kind of an interesting idea. Oh, they, okay. They'd allow you to transfer for free to these new worlds. But that still has a pretty massive implication. Because if you have smaller worlds that are starting from scratch compared to worlds that have long-standing many year long communities yeah, trying splitting the communities apart into different uh... exactly so there has been quite a blowback from this suggestion in the forums in that you're going to have a lot of people that don't want to do this you might have some people pioneering enough for it but you should uh, you being anet should really consider making it available that they could transfer back if it doesn't work out because stranding people over there is really kind of not cool um they also asked in this proposal uh would you personally be interested in transferring almost everybody has because they basically did a three question thing how do you feel about the proposal what would you change if anything about the proposal and would you be interested in transferring to a new world? People are answering those three questions for them quite well. Um, but number three, would you be willing to transfer yourself? Almost everyone has said, no, I'd stay where I am. Because they have their communities, they have their guilds. And uh, a lot of servers are actually, um, because of all the Heart of Thorns release nonsense that in a way kind of bludgeoned and killed world versus world to a degree um a lot of the guilds that used to be really hard war world versus world guilds have simply left the game so you're there's a there's a um there's a drought in available world versus world guilds to try and fill all of your time slots and be a competitive server so if you're splitting the servers and making even more servers you're making that drought even more painful. So the the other concern is that even if it works and you could get people to transfer and you could get the numbers to match up and get like really even matchups in population, that you would have such bad coverage disparity on it that it would kind of ruin the ability to play the game because you'd have people on you'd ha basically just have time zones that don't match up <laughs> team a might play during the usa time zones and all the other teams don't have anybody on that time zone so they just kind of sit there and hold keeps with no effort and have nobody to fight or play against and then they come back they go to bed and they wake up and the same thing has happened but in the other direction with the other teams because there's not enough people to play. So, yeah. Kind of a big deal on this proposal. Don't know how far it's going. As I said, there's been quite a bit of backlash on it with people going like, look, we understand what you're trying to do, and there's some merit to it, but, but no, most of us don't think this is going to work. You need to try something different with this. I mean, use this idea as a, you know, base ground but you know you need to either really rework the proposal or you know come up with something new or many have suggested like look you guys tried tackling the population problem before um by changing population sizes for servers and all that kind of nonsense and fudging the numbers and it's had limited success and in some cases backfired Though I think one of the things they did, um, I think when I my computer blew up, was they, was it they increased or they de? Oh no 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 no, they um they made population for world versus world 
uh, based on the people that actually play it. Ah. So if Fort Aspenwood has 80% of its player base logging into World vs. World for at least an hour each week or something like that, I'm making up numbers for what it's worth. But um, then they count as you know, world versus world players, and they use that number of players to calculate how large or small a server is. Whereas in the past, it was just how many people chose Fort Aspenwood as a server, even if they never ever set foot in world versus world. So you had a lot of servers where as many as 50% of the population or more wasn't playing world versus world, and yet they have full status. And so they couldn't get world versus world players in to the server. And yet they had virtually nobody playing. So they were, what, there was a term for that. Not deadlocked, but that is basically what it is. But, so, I I know uh, Maguma at one point had that, as did Dragon Brand. FA has had a pretty healthy world versus world population for a long time, so we have kind of dodged that bullet, but we've had our full problems in the past. Mm. So I haven't really been around for those problems, but I know they're still kicking. There's also a few more interesting proposals that are uh, um, going about that I would actually probably read up a little bit more on before I said anything. So let's uh let's talk about Super Mario Run instead. Okay, we'll okay. come back it's, to World uh, War. It's a mobile game that Nintendo's releasing on the 13th of December, I think. I'm going to have to pull that up to confirm. But it is a one-handed Mario game where Mario just kind of runs to the right and you tap the screen and he jumps. Nice. It is free to so try. It's Temple Run. What? Sorry. <laughs> so it's Temple Run. Basically. And all yeah. of its spin offs. Basically, yeah. And uh, it's free to try, but costs. Oh, it's December the 15th. My bad. Yeah. But yeah, it's free to try, but costs $10 to play the full game. Uh, when you're trying it, you get a sample of each game mode, and when you buy it, you get to play all of them in the full version, in their full, unfiltered version, I guess. It looks to be coming out for iOS only. I'm not really seeing anything for Android. But yeah, this would be Nintendo's second mobile game ever. Huh. The first being Miitomo. Which actually just got an update recently where you can customize your room. Isn't this the thing where you made it say strange things on the yes. podcast? Like in the yes. early <laughs> podcast days? <laughs> yes, I did. And Mel too. Mel did too. Yeah, I would say I feel like it was you, Mel, and maybe even Brian or something. I, I feel like there was a we were having a inner podcast conversation through <laughs> robot voices or something like that. Yeah. And isn't that basically you take like your your Wii avatar as like your mobile? Uh, like you a, make a separate one, but yeah, that's something? basically it. They added a bunch of new features. I forget. I haven't really played with all of them, but the biggest one is you can customize your room now. There's supposed to be a chat function now. I have not messed with that yet, though. But yeah, congrats Nintendo on your second mobile game. Sounds good to me, though I'm not a big, big fan of Temple. <laughs> run and any of its spin-offs so i'm kind of like a okay low effort bar here nintendo come on yeah <laughs> but at the same time they are working on a crazy new console so i guess they probably don't have a lot of people dedicated to mo- new mobile content at the moment then again nintendo is a giant huge company so you'd think they'd be able to pull something a little better off but yeah it looks to be well from a Outsider standpoint, it looks like they may have used the Mario Maker engine or something similar to it to make it, so it might not have been that much work. I mean, nowadays, it's not hard to make a game. You just buy an engine and whoop de doo put some shit in there, it's done. RPG Maker's kind of the same way. Fair enough. 
I, I, I follow that. Not to discredit video game developers, but you could make something stupidly simple if you wanted to. Right. So I would at least be interested to see, I mean, I'm sure the fact that you'd have Nintendo and Mario assets in a temple run kind of a game would be, you know, novelty factor alone. Hmm. I mean, Nintendo has always championed and really beat the crap out of that horse to the point where I'm sure it's a, a dusty husk at this point. <laughs> They're always good at using their IP and making everybody come back for it. Oh, yeah. Really love the new Smash Brothers. Anyway. Um, so what's your guild problem there, Shro? Oh, that's uh, simply the fact that I, I have a guild addiction. Oh. Uh, I, I have you s- tell. I have six guilds in <laughs> the five guild limit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> guild Wars 2. And despite that, I have recently basically joined up on two more guilds, and because I can't actually accept their guild invites, I'm just, like, paying attention to their, like, Discord chats or, you know, talking with friends that are in those guilds and trying to coordinate with them. So I, I'm just, like, sure, I'm like, all the guilds, playing all the guilds, do all the things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's called Guild Wars. It's true, but mm. oh my god. I suppose it's so, worth mentioning yeah. that the sixth guild you're part of is technically a guild that shouldn't exist anymore. It's true. And that's why, I, mm. that's how I broke the system. <laughs> I'm still tempted to make a free-to-play account just to manage that guild. Do it. Another time. But it should be worth at the mentioning. moment. It's Sorry. it's fun that I have you know six guilds and a five guild limit. Yeah. <laughs> should be worth mentioning that this sixth guild of his is a world v world guild made specifically for a world v world beta test. Yeah, I would say it's not. It's less a world versus world guild and yeah. more a. It was a beta testers guild because when Ana invited a bunch of us to be beta testers for the new world versus world mechanics that involved a lot of guilds having to claim objectives in order to use the new tactics, improvements, and slots for all the new upgrades. Uh, they forgot to make a, the beta so that the players could do those things without having to be a part of a guild. So and, players had to make guilds and... Uh, right. Yeah. And they didn't get rid of the guilds afterwards, so there's this one guild say, now Yep. that doesn't really have an acronym. I mean, technically it does. It would be BB, but because beta and weirdness, it yeah. doesn't store the acronym for some reason. <laughs> so there's this guild that should have an acronym, but doesn't. And it's on Fort Aspenwood, and it's owned by Shro right now. <laughs> Yeah, I would say it wasn't really owned by me or started by me, yeah. but I, I ended up being now. the sole surviving member. <laughs> <laughs> but I can invite people to it because of that, so yay! Okay. Also, I, I think I can talk about this. Um, the other thing that I was looking at in World vs. World is that uh, linked servers um, in World vs. World the naming of things takes the highest ranked server's name. So, like, Fort Aspenwood is with uh, Sanctum of Raw right now. At least I'm pretty sure that's who we're with. Mm -hmm. Um, But even if the Sanctum of Raw guys uh, capture something, or if they... Like, if if another team uh, runs into them, they show up as Fort Aspenwood because Fort Aspenwood is a higher ranked server. We are the top dog in our team. And yes, it is Sanctum of Raw. So Uh, it's kind of shitty for some of the lower tier servers because yeah, they get better fights. They, they get to play with more people and you know, they they are generally hopefully having a better experience because of these things. But they're not Um, getting the credit. 
Right. They they have like an identity crisis because everything calls them Fort Aspenwood. And I mean, that's cool for us Fort Aspenwood people, but it's kind of shitty for them. So Anet has been trying to figure out how to solve that. And they've come up with three ideas. One is an alliance name proposal where we I read this as we just create an identity crisis for every team. <laughs> Well, like, that team name is like them. what I was thinking just now, because hell, if we could all agree on one team name, then we wouldn't have an, uh, much of an identity crisis, would we? Eh, sort of. Let me read it to you. Um, names would be generated from a new pool of names that Anet would be creating, and any uh, um, any team combination once they... the combination is created would be assigned an alliance name and until that combination is broken they would keep that name throughout several matchups mm. and uh so that's kind of cool and then they have they would say that the pool would keep getting used and no names would be reused until the entire pool had been exhausted and reset um everything in the ui would show up that way as you know this alliance has captured the thing i like and dislike that but let we'll come back to that um actually no it's probably makes more sense to talk about it now so i like the idea that it does you know unify the groups for sure but at the same time it also kind of takes away from the this server did that and you have instead an alliance. And part of the, my, my thinking along that is like, well, right now, Fort Aspenwood, we decided to get together. We're literally making t-shirts for ourselves <laughs> and merchandise that say, you know, Fort Aspenwood and, you know, Guild Wars 2 stuff and has the Fort Aspenwood logo because, yes, we have a logo. And so if you make it alliance-based, we understand the purpose for that, and I'm sure a lot of us would be fine with it, but it kind of takes away from the fun of being, you know, Hoorah Fort Aspenwood, because now we're Hoorah Alliance B, or whatever the hell the name would be. So, that's kind of my iffy, I'm iffy on that one. The next one would be, um, they call it guild-focused, but it seems less about the guilds um it it would reduce the teams to just red green and blue to the team color instead of saying fort aspenwood or anything or any it would literally just say red green blue for the borderlands and the, the scorecard and everything so it'd basically um, be like uh the edge of the mists yeah thing. they would turn yeah. it to edge of the mists and what we use is slang because we half the time say we're on green BL or whatever. Um, yeah. Only because F Dear Sweet Aspen, Fort Aspenwood is uh, the only actual acronym that you can pronounce as a word. Fable. Fable. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Yakspend is kind of close. We call Yakspend Yibble. But, um,. So I, I kind of agree with the idea of changing the colors, but that still has the same idea of you lose um, kind of an identity yeah, you there. You lose the pride but, of your server kind of thing. Exactly. Um, but as part of that one, though, it would promote guilds a little bit so that um, a guild... Bleh, 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 bleh. Objectives that are captured by a guild would get their guild name a little bit more prominently uh so rather than like right now uh, a cool new feature when i got back into the game is that if fort aspenwood captures ascension bay all across all the server maps you would see a splash screen that says fort aspenwood has captured ascension bay that pops up on the screen for like a second so it's kind of like a play-by-play -play thing. Now that screen would say, um, the Legion of Char has captured Ascension Bay for, like, the green team or the red team or whatever. 
so you could kind of see the the guilds that were going on but that is possibly a concern because then that would also tell you without having to even be on that map what guild captured that objective so you can kind of track where certain guilds are throughout the game mode if you're a map whore you can already do that so that might not have as much argument but you have to be one of those people that's pulling up the map and tracking which objectives are claimed by what guild all the time mm. not everybody's doing that the last one is i think the proposal i like the most and that is that the quote guests servers the lower tier servers that are linked with you would just be given more credit um if they're capturing the objectives um, or they're doing a lot of the work, um, the, the map change or map name wouldn't really change. It would still always be like Fort Aspenwood, Borderland. But if they just get more credit for certain things, like capping right. map, capping, ha, capping objectives and stuff, right? Right. So if Sanctum of Raw captured Ascension Bay, it would say Sanctum of Raw captured Ascension Bay instead of Fort Aspenwood, even though they're yeah. teamed with Fort Aspenwood, which is what it shows right now. So I actually think they could go further and say, you know, they could actually show that you're, if I was fighting Fort Aspenwood and Sanctum of Raw, that I could see people that are both Fort Aspenwood and Sanctum of Raw. Uh, as enemies instead of just seeing everybody as Fort Aspenwood enemies. But they're actually saying at the moment they don't want to do that because they think it would make fighting more confusing. So, I think well, that is a lot of cents, info, yeah. Eh, it just literally changes the name over somebody's head. Yeah, but then you think, oh hey, there's like four enemy factions coming our way. Fuck my life, I'm screwed. Well, see, the illusion a, of there being seasoned, more enemies. Eh, I, I get that. But as a seasoned world versus world person, I'm going to look at that as just how much red do I see? Are, are they going to raffle stomp us because they are a lot more than us? That's fine. I don't care if they're five different names or one name. Are there five different names but only five different people? I'm going to stomp that. But I... That's just how I see it, as having done it for a long time. As someone who hasn't, like me, it, it seems a bit overwhelming to see four different enemy servers come after you. Right. And I think what they're confused about is not only that, but then you'd also have to think about like which servers are teamed up in what ways. Because if you see a map that, like, what's our matchup right now? We have... It's Fort Aspenwood, Sanctum of Raw, Yaks Bend, Anvil Rock, Eridon Terrace, and Maguma. Those are six servers that are playing in our matchup right now as three different teams. So if you didn't know who was teamed up with who and you saw all five of your enemies on the map at once, you wouldn't know who's on which team unless you knew already in advance which team was which. Mm. So I think that's where the real confusion ends up coming, because then you're just like, well, I killed the Yak Spend people, and I killed the Maguma people, but this Eridon Terrace group beat us, and they still captured it, and I thought I beat all the Yak Spend people. Oh, wait, Eridon Terrace is with Maguma. That's why it turned green instead of red. Blurred. So, I get that. And, but I still think I like option three more because it gives the servers that aren't having a chance to really have any pride about what they're doing a better bit of pride. Though, yeah. I'd even go maybe further and say that, you know, switch it up every week. Maybe instead of Fort Aspenwood BL, make it. Sanctum of Raw BL. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with bad. that. 
where the team is still the same and we can still get credit for capturing objectives. It's not like there's there's literally nothing but pride out of having your name as the, the main name. And Sorry, I have to take a phone it, call. Uh oh. Call it humility, but uh I'll I I just think that's a working proposal. But um I don't know if dude's actually going to disappear and keep recording, so I'm just going to keep talking by myself here and hope that I can keep this running. A um, few other things that we're talking about is uh, I finally got to level 350 oh, on scribing, which means... Oh, hey, he's back already. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> I was just kind of talking as a now lonely host. <laughs> Not oh. sure how long you'd be gone. Sorry. So, no, that's all, all good. I was just like, all right, how many things can I talk about by myself here? <laughs> um, but no, I was saying I've made it to 351 in scribing. Oh, nice. So I can pretty much craft almost everything right now outside of the you must be max level to craft it. And I'm not even sure there really are any decorations that are that. I think it's just like a few uh, schematics for world versus world and probably legendary related shit. Um, so I said it in Discord, and I think everybody was asleep, so it didn't really get much traction, but if people want stuff, decoration-wise, there is somebody in the guild that can make it now. So, if you can at least help me get some of the materials, the basic materials for it, uh, I can make us, you know, really spiffy, awesome decorations now. So, yeah. Send your don't send your guild hall decoration requests to Shro, and maybe try to suggest maybe suggest some flat surfaces so we can get some more uh, guild jumping puzzles going. Yeah, that too. I want to expand the one we made. I'm I'm glad I did that on a whim. That was fun. Yeah, it's actually like a kind of challenging jumping puzzle, so I like it. <laughs> I did a good. Dude, did a good. Um, and speaking of requests, uh, I am working on the forum post right actually before we started recording. It should be posted later this afternoon. Um, of trying to get some schedule rescheduling done for what's going to yep there goes telegram finally had it uh for what for what uh ia wants to do as far as gaming events um as i mentioned last week i'm waiting for a hardware uh piece that should allow me to bring a server online so that we can have some game servers for simple games assuming my internet connection isn't su super shitty um i did actually try to go pick up that piece of hardware but my friend couldn't find it because his roommate lady friend person appeared to have moved it and she was at work and so he was like i know it's here i just don't know where <laughs> so yeah i should be getting that soon um and then i know uh some people have requested uh, maybe moving team fortress two night uh away from saturday night to something else um, I know I would like to get some sort of Guild Wars 2 night going again, uh, whether it's linked with uh, like doing guild missions or it's just a time we all agree to try to be on Guild Wars 2 and just do whatever the fuck we feel like doing that night. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. And then other ideas for like, at one point, we had Terraria Day, but I don't think anybody's been playing Terraria for the last, like, six months. Um, Terraria has an end. Like, a finite end. And it's not as open as, yeah. like, Minecraft. Yeah. So it's easy to get burned out of something like that. Well, that's... I think we mentioned it the other time, because I remember Brian talking about the reset, like, a... Uh, yeah, like, I'm give thinking it a reset we can every reset. month or so. Right. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, look for those posts on the website. 
Um, I've gotten back into some of the website coding, trying to get some of that up to speed. Uh, I'm going to be bugging the Nightwatch Council group about themes here soon, which is a long overdue thing. So, yay, doing stuff and things. Yay. Yeah. So, Pokemon Sun and Moon is finally coming out, huh? Ah, uh, yeah. Actually, very, very soon. On the 18th of November, 2016. So probably like a couple days after this goes live, maybe one day to go after this goes live. And IGN seems to already have a review of it out, even though it's not out yet. Review copies. Gotta love them. They rated a 9 out of 10. It's an editor's choice, so I don't really trust IGN with their review score, but eh, maybe they're good. Maybe they got something. I'm. I'm just looking at Sand Slash and how either that's ice or that's like crystals on his back. The Alola Sand Slash. Huh. I don't I, know. I don't know how to feel about the Alola forms. I like the white Vulpix and Ninetales. That that looks kind of cool. But Executor? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is wrong with Executor? Yeah. What the fuck? I mean, talk about instant meme. Yeah, that that was an instant meme. I mean, you didn't even have to add hot water to that shit. That was just <laughs> like it was ready out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder does so, that mean he, one of them looks one of the eggs on Executor looks either really sassy or really high, or maybe just turned on and the neck is is the is the sign of like I've got a hard on oh my. just gets taller and taller as he stands <laughs> next to you breathing heavily yeah that first face that looks super happy is like hey, I'm gonna I want to have the sex with you oh god <sighs> I, I think there was a demo on it? the 3ds it's store. on 3DS, right? Yeah, it's a 3DS game. I think uh. there's a demo in the 3DS store now, but I have not played it yet, and I feel stupid for not trying it. One of these days, I will actually get myself a 3DS. You should. It's a great console. Yes. Uh, get the or 3DS. No, there's, a, there's a major difference between those, isn't there? Other than yeah. the, the 3D technology, huh? Uh, did you say you're getting a 2DS? Or just no, I was... I was saying that there's major hardware differences between the 3DS and the normal DS, isn't uh, yeah, there? Yeah, it's completely fucking different. Like, the 3DS is a separate console entirely. It's its own thing. It's like the Wii U and the Wii. They're not backwards compatible. Or at least the DS not, can't really? play 3DS games, but the 3DS can play DS games. I don't. Well, they need that to makes re re they need to rethink their naming, their their naming conventions. Cause fucking shit. Well, every fucking console does this. I mean, yeah, but at least PlayStation with... One, Two, Three, Four Pro. Yeah, PS4 Pro's stupid. Idea. That's gonna they cause should... issues. Yeah, they need to rename, think those names. Xbox, Xbox 360, Xbox One. That's con <laughs> the latest Xbox was confusing. Nintendo's the worst, though. Yeah, like, Nintendo's DS, probably DSi, the worst. DS, DSXL, 3DS, 3DS XL, 3DS New, 2DS, Wii, Wii U, and that other Wii that didn't have internet access. I forget what it was, and now it's the Nintendo Switch. What will they do with the Virtual Nintendo Boy. Switch, I wonder? Oh, the second version, the Swatch. Switch XD. <laughs> the Switch XL, and it's this like fucking mega tablet. I would say <laughs> it's, just your a, it's just a 20, 20 inch TV. Yeah. <laughs> or the Switch Mini, and it's just your phone. Actually, that'd be kind of cool. A Switch Mini, and it's yeah. your phone. <laughs> it's just like phone size. But you can, it's a like, thousand still... dollar gaming console phone. Yeah. Well, every smartphone's now kind of a gaming console. Yeah. 
I'm always like a few years behind on phone, so it's like all the new shit that comes out is like technically I can run it on my system, but Will it work for long? Yeah, I would say it's like but my system might also just kind of show the loading screen for the next twenty minutes. <laughs> Like last night, my poor tablet crapped out. It's, oh, it's such an old tablet. It's a 2012 tablet, Nexus 7. and it, and pepperoni. It, it cannot handle the, the 2016 Android interface. Oh, it's like, oh my god. There's internet, and I'm getting data, and I can't handle it. But yeah, I, I look forward to Pokemon Sun and Moon's release, especially after uh, Pokemon Go came out. That had to bring a lot of new people into Pokemon. I'm wondering how this will go. Right. I would say I'm actually kind of sad that they didn't try to team Sun and Moon. Like, when I heard about Sun and Moon, I thought it was coming out in the heyday of Pokemon Go, and they'd, like, made out a marketing deal for that. And part of me wishes they had done that, because I feel like Pokemon Go might not have died quickly or at least would have gotten a little more love before it went out the gate because you know people played it they had their fun for you know four weeks six weeks or so and then it died i haven't even opened the game for the last month and a half i haven't either my mom's more avid a player than i was and she still is playing it it seems that's strange but yeah fair enough people are getting into it it's not just so. kids not just them kids and 20-somethings. I mean, it killed me that uh, it basically... I, I sussed it out as a... Uh, you have to grind like mad to get level-up materials. Mm -hmm. And that's especially difficult when that means you have to drive like 20, 30 minutes away to go to a place where you can grind like mad. Um, Unless you're and, lucky and live in the city. Right. Um, and then the fact that the battling mechanics for gyms, I'm just not fond of. If it actually was more like a normal Pokemon game where you could, like, even trade out two skills or something on things rather than just having to fish RNGs style for the right Pokemon on it, and you could, like, really work with the one Pokemon you got early on and, like, level them up and tweak their their move list and all that kind of shit, then, then I would have been really into it. But, no. That and again, yeah. old hardware, there were many times where I did gym battles and died because of lag. Ouch. So. Oh, look, I'm, I'm getting this guy. I'm gonna win this battle. Woo. And, oh, wait, my, my, my Pokemon isn't moving. He isn't moving. I'm telling him to move and do stuff, and he's not, oh, and he's dead. What the fuck just happened? If it was that, less that of was a, a tapping strategy game and more yeah, of like no, the I original hate, battle I system, it probably would have worked. Yeah. Right. It was like a missed opportunity on their part. It would have been nice. Oh, it, for sure. For sure. So, yeah. But anyway. Well, there's uh, also something I was eating lunch before we recorded, and mm -hmm. as I eat my meals, I typically pull up YouTube or one of the shows that I'm watching. And this time I did YouTube and I actually watch with the, the ad blocker off when I'm doing that sort of a thing. And good so on I you. Got this, By the I way, got this turn ad. that off when you go to YouTube because that supports YouTubers. Anyway, go ahead. It depends on what I'm watching. Okay. <laughs> Firefox, when I'm normally just like looking at bullshit videos. No, that shit, that shit stays on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But if you're watching like a YouTuber, I would say I'm, so if funny. I'm watching like, stuff I subscribe to, I watch yeah. it through Google where it's turned off. Okay. Continue. So, uh, but, um, no, I got an ad that I will actually watch ads if they catch my interest, and I haven't seen it a bajillion times already. Hmm. Uh, so new movies, new games, just interesting stuff. Like, one video was, you know, tech theater set up things for a convention that I'm not very familiar with, but you know, they were talking about tech theater stuff and doing montages of setting up cool lights and stages and shit. I'm like, you know what? I'm entertained. 
I will watch this for 30 seconds. But no, the interesting one that I saw was uh, this like minute and a half Overwatch commercial. And it wasn't actually about Overwatch itself, but it was a idea of trying to talk about the esports of Overwatch and something called Overwatch League. Or as you spelled it in the notes, overwatchleague.com. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, um, it was a, it was an interesting commercial that they, they played on the idea, of, you know, what's in a name and, you know, build up your name, level up your name. Kind <laughs> of <thing>. it, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it was it was a well done. Yeah, it, it was well little done, commercial. Um, but the fact that it was a uh, Overwatch and the fact that it was esports as a I don't know if I'd call it mainstream, but uh clearly targeted marketing. I will give yeah. you that. I, I'm sure that my uh, my Google AdSense history, whatever the hell you want to call it, is related to this. Also, somebody is blowing up my Hangouts chat. All I hear right now is ding, ding, bling, ding, bling, ding, bling, ding, bling, bling, bling. Should we? And should like this be the new drinking game? It. Just like, oh my god! <laughs> whenever you hear the whatever no, the Hangout notifications, <laughs> you just take a shot. Oh my god! What? My phone isn't doing it, but my headset is. It's like double and triple tapping the beep <laughs> noise. So I'm I'm literally hearing this is just ding 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 ding. Jesus Christ, what the hell is going on? Uh more of it. Okay, maybe oh, don't make okay. this the new drinking game because you will be dead before the end of the episode. I was saying my liver. My liver. Okay, uh, so what it is, is my friend that has, that I did the car work on, I asked him for yeah. pictures before he sold it so that I could, like, look back at the work I did. And now he's and, sending pictures. Yeah. He apparently took eight bajillion pictures. <laughs> I, well, I right don't then. know. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We're at least in the 20s. And <laughs> we're still getting them. Shit. Jesus. Okay. He really wants this car sold, doesn't he? I don't know why he took that many pictures, but okay. I'm excited. Um, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Overwatch League, that's kind of cool. Oh, um, yeah. And we have a new sort of podcast? At least a new podcast idea coming up. Might be for a one one episode alone, I don't know. Maybe more. But... But it is a new podcast about Dungeons & Dragons. Aw, uh, yeah. Gonna play the d and I'm gonna say, I, to me, I don't know, a podcast is a talk show. Yeah. And not all podcasts actually obey that rule, in my mind, because it's my mind. Yeah. And so I, I feel like this one, it, it really is. It's going to be more about us recording. Recording us our audio D &D. playing D&D, &D, yeah. So it, it'll be less a talk show and more a, do you want to vicariously live through D&D &D with IA? Well, now you can. My friend Shro here seems to have conveniently forgotten about the episode of the podcast where we played Cards Against Humanity for Fire Tits McGee's birthday. It's on YouTube exclusively. Go in the description below to find it and watch it and yell at Shro in the comments and tell him how uh, stupid, stupid he is. <laughs> well, it's happened before with, like, I think Wizards of the Coast has their own podcast for D&D. &D. Oh, yeah, specifically yeah, for there playing are a it number too. of gaming podcasts yeah. and game play-by-play -play podcasts. I That'd guess that's what cool I think of it as, as, as a as a play-by-play. -play. Yeah, That'd be kind of also. Fun. I I'm still working on my character because I actually am so out of pace with D and D that I have to read up on making D and D characters again. Um, but I I think I'm going to be a Kenku, which. Mm -hmm is known in the Pathfinder sister universe, or rather sister system of D&D &D, uh, as a Tengu. 
And it is oh, exactly what your thing. brain just thought of. The bird thing. Yeah. I didn't right. realize that Pathfinder called the bird people Tengu, and that Anet basically lifted that. So, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Now Anet has less of an excuse. Pathfinder has already told them what the Tengu specialize in. The well, skill set is already there. They already got it from, like, Japanese folklore. So... Actually, Same I think statement. Tengu in folklore look a lot worse than they do in what we know as in Guild Wars. It's like humans yeah, with they're... long noses and ugly ass faces. And wings. Well, yeah. Myth yeah. It. It's called mythology. I know. <laughs> and mythology is not always kind to its figures. Yeah. But there's also something that... Uh, was being shown to me that I can't remember the name. It starts with an A. The it's a similar bird race. It might even be the same one because these guys have like a bajillion fairly, different birds. Fairly similar names. Yeah. Um, Arokakra. Oh, what now? Aro Arokakwa. Arokakwa. Oh, good really? lord. I'll find... Okay. In the meantime, I guess I might as well say what I made. I'm a dwarf, and the GM, Mel, uh, just kind of, like, is being passive-aggressive with me on that choice, because I could have been anything oh. else, and I chose a fucking dwarf. <laughs> I could have I'm been one of the new bird races. Dwarf. I could have been something exciting, but no, I stuck with a fucking dwarf. I mean, I know a lot of players that play dwarves, so... I know. <laughs> I'm, she's kidding, I'm sure, but like... It, it, I, I, I want to play a dwarf. Well, you gotta make fun of me. Sir, I wasn't making up the name. Oh, did you post Power it yet? Coca. No, you didn't. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay. I did, I... Quit lying! I wasn't looking at Discord because it doesn't notify me when I'm on on OBS. And whose fault is that? That's Discord's, actually, because it automatically turns on that mode of thing when I open OBS. And if I, I disable mean, it, then that you hear all sorts of plinks and plunks when people start talking to me and in IA chat. And I'd rather not have that in the podcast, thank you very much. So that's your fault there, Mr. Discord. Or anyway. sending you 23-some pictures <laughs> of the car. <laughs> or a cockra, I guess. I, I, I guess. That may be it. Okay. Anyway. Let's get this old man Henderson story done. I was like, I feel like it's time for some old man Henderson. Yes. This is Director's Cut Part 4. It is the shortest director's cut, and it is the final director's cut. I think when I left off with our story, our intrepid heroes, quote-unquote, had gotten their hands on tacos and narrowly avoided getting arrested. Henderson is formally introduced to Carrie at this point, and I decline the offer to take over her character to get back in the game. I already had a character in mind, and the session was almost over at this point anyway. Henderson, being the responsible adult that he is, takes the kids to Henry's. If you're old enough to kill cultists, you're old enough to drink. He told them and grabbed everyone a beer. I got most of the way into an elaborate The Big Lebowski reference when Mike finally asks a question in a tone of voice that suggested irritation. What the hell are you guys talking about? What? I mean, you guys are clearly having a laugh at my expense. I don't mind that, but I'm not getting the joke and it's pissing me off. Dude. Henderson is practically the dude from The Big Lebowski. That can't be accidental. It was. I've never seen that movie. What? I've never seen The Big Lebowski. What the fuck do you mean you've never seen it? I'm not sure how that can be interpreted. I think my uncle mentioned liking it in passing once. But to be fair, again, I've never seen this movie either. God, and people have made it. reference to that, even though my name's Dude Run. It's not referencing the Big Lebowski. Anyway. Son, I am disappointed. Eh, you would be. 
So the GM agreed to call the evening right there so we could work on the next part of the game while we dragged our fearless leader to watch what we thought was a fantastic movie. So at Harry's, they bump into my second to last character, Malcolm Reeves. Mal was a soldier who just discharged from the military after a tour of duty sent him into a nest of monsters. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, hallucinations caused by PTSD, and sent home. He overhears Henderson talking about cultists and deformed hell poodles, and asks if he can get involved. We move out of the bar as evening begins to set in, in various degrees of drunk. We start with the building Henderson exploded. Nothing. We go back to the remains of the church Henderson burned down. Nada. Same story with the old mansion and the cult meeting we saved from. We saved Carrie from. Fookin' cultists, Henderson yelled in dismay. Not one clue anywhere. Maybe if you didn't burn down everything, we'd have more to work with, Mal suggests. We wage a scorched earth sort of war here, kid, Henderson says darkly. But that can wait until we get a lead. Anyone have any ideas? Jimmy, buzz well on its way to wearing off, raises a hand. Uh, the internet? What in the hell is an internet? And then Henderson learns something new about the world. Seeing as how Carrie and Jimmy's parents wouldn't want a trio of random dudes showing up to use their computers, they do the next most logical thing. They break into the library and use the public access lines. Sadly, Google had zero results under Goram Poodle Fookin Cultists. <laughs> Disciples of the Yellow King, as Jimmy pointed out, then corrected Henderson's spelling, had a list of locations and possible meeting places for various groups across the city. There were ten unmolested locations at this point, and several of them were having meetings this very night. Clearly, the GM was wanting us to get back to investigating. Henderson instead bought enough gasoline to make about 50 Molotovs, and we burned every one of those motherfuckers down that evening before dropping off the kids at home for a good night's sleep. Mal buys the first round as we watch the news, seeing our exploits played all over TV. We all got a good laugh when the cops apparently failed their assorted checks, tests, and investigations, since we players decided as a group that going to confront possible suspects meant having no fucking clue what's going on, and we're going to go arrest Jeff Bridges, Kevin Smith, and Marshall Mathers. <laughs> Triumphantly, we return home for the evening and we all catch the news and the next morning. Apparently, people are appalled by the hate crimes against this one religious group in the community, and they send their prayers with them. The head of the local cultists thanked the community for their concern and said that we had the permission that he had the permission of the local government to gather together for and pray for the souls of their departed in a local high school gym. In retrospect, the GM telling us that every living cultist of Hastur would be gathering into one convenient location should have been a hint that it was a trap. Like one big enough to be visible from space kind of a trap. This is when Henderson had a, quote, cunning plan. He was going to go there and talk to the head cultist guy. I tell him that it's a fantastic plan since Will already shared the summoning of the demon thing Henderson accidentally accomplished with him. So the new plan, of which Henderson was only vaguely aware, was that Jimmy was going to help the deacon set up a slideshow thing for all the words of the prayer that he was going to lead. Henderson asked what significance lawn gnomes had in their worship. The deacon, after deducing that he wasn't in fact being mocked and was the guy was being serious, explained that the church was rather neutral on the topic of lawn gnomes. <laughs> Henderson then kept chasing the line as hard as he could, asking about things like human non human gnome relationships and whether gnomes had souls. Whether said souled gnomes could theoretically be used as sacrifices to Satan or any other gods as well. The deacon then, and I'm quoting the GM here, in the only good line he had in the entire game, gave Henderson a look a look that can only be summed up as, Dude, I fucked a Shoggoth and you're creeping me out. <sighs> Jimmy, then lay Jimmy then led Henderson away from the fracas after he completed his secret mission of changing one of the slides about a third of the way into the show. That evening, the cultists prayed to Hastur. 
They asked for guidance and protection. They asked that their dead be avenged. They asked that they be allowed to continue serving. Or at least that was the intent. One of the salides had been changed to say something more like, Alawila al Cthulhu flagon, Kalifafer is our Kasfal Depwa. One horrible tentacled monstrosity per member sang the prayers out loud. Later, the GM assumed that we would crash the show. We chose instead to barricade the doors and leave. <laughs> After the horrors had ripped apart the cultists, they turned on each other. Soon the hall was left with only the dead and dying, while some stone cold motherfuckers shot pool across town. However, we didn't account for one thing. Hestur wasn't the only game in town, and a high priest of Cthulhu felt a hundred monsters being called into the world in his master's name. He investigates and finds the scene of the crime, and then looks into the earlier summoning performed by Henderson. Gravely insulted by the turn of affairs, he uses a sympathetic binding using what little remained of the corpse to sick a pair of hellhounds on Henderson before returning to his own meditations. When they catch up to him, Will's already gone, the kids are sleeping, and Henderson's going for a walk with Malcolm. We're in the park, not far from his house, apart, about to part ways when we hear a horrible snarling noise. Pistol is drawn, we got a lucky shot off and kill one of them while the second leaps onto Henderson's face. He throws it off and dodges its second coming. Guess who gets a crit to the fucking throat? Fucking guess. Yes, I'm still bitter that no character other than Simon survived across multiple sessions. So as the monster kills me, Henderson manages a few solid kicks into it. The summoner, having detected a kill from his beast, dismissed the survivor, assuming that he got the kill he desired. Henderson called the cops, and Mal was given a small but tasteful funeral at the military's expense. The official police report read it was a mauling by some dogs that apparently escaped heavily wounded. The surviving party members raised a glass in his name while you and I are going to diverge from the sad scene. That night, on the way home, I had a terrible premonition. I now wonder, looking back, if this is what the same fey mood that took Mike, Waffle House millionaire, the evening he created Henderson. I lurked forums, I googled strategies, I shared small snippets of my sob story online while I accumulated knowledge. Henderson was born of madness, and a man's hatred towards blind antagonism by a horrible GM. I, on the other hand, turned my eyes towards a more, a magic, more solid, practiced, dependable. I turned to evil. <laughs> I delved into deliberate munchkinism for one express purpose. The creation of Simon Breckenridge, British spy. I knew setting out that I could never curb Henderson's madness. I could never hope to match it either. I therefore built Henderson's exact opposite. He was competent. Sane, cunning. He was his karmic balance, his yin to his yang, his fucking soulmate in plot annihilation and derailment. <laughs> the perfect support character. When utilized properly, a well made played support character is a fucking force multiplier for team effectiveness. Since Henderson was already wrecking the campaign harder than anything I could have possibly imagined or designed, I chose to co opt his efforts and make the Henderson situation exponentially worse. Since I've been absent for longer than intended from the whole director's cut thing I've been doing, I'm going to power through the rest of the story tonight, so excuse me while I go slip into something a bit more comfortable and grab a snack. At which point, Waffle House Millionaire interjects, wait, Simon was intentional? That explains so much. <laughs> Man, I can't make shit up off the cuff like you can. Simon was a week's effort. I skipped a couple classes to perfect his technique. Um, that's actually a fairly good stopping point if you wanted to stop there. Otherwise, I see about another 10 minutes in our future. Uh, yeah, I'd like to stop. I gotta do some stuff outside of the podcast. Alright. Well, so. with the creation of Simon Breckedridge, born of the fires of evil, we will finish the great story. Of old man Henderson. Is it like lawful evil versus chaotic good? Or chaotic uh, neutral would be Henderson? I don't Call know. Call of Cthulhu doesn't have alignments. Ow. In fact, a lot of systems I play don't have alignments. It's just kind of assumed that if you're a dick, you're going to have karma come up and it's from the GM. Yeah. But, uh. Yeah, no. It, it, it's just that, uh. The, the player in this case has had such a, uh. Shitty time, yeah. That uh, 
In instead of trying to play the chaos factor, he's just going to play the be a dick within the bounds of the game. Yeah. So, but he did it in such a way that it it, it meshes really, really well with Henderson's nonsense. Be the Moriarty to the Sherlock. Or something, I don't know. Pretty much. Anyway, that's about all our topics for today, and as I said, yep, I gotta actually go. actually finished with Henderson for once. Yeah. Almost done. Just like one more Henderson line, maybe. Anyway, thank you all for listening in, and thank you, Shrill, for joining me. Being in this little thing together. I did the stuff. Yay. And now I'm gonna go wash my butt in okay. the shower. Now I'm gonna go get food. It's Yay apparently food. been sitting in my uh on the counter in my kitchen for a while and yeah. But so I better go get food. Forgot about it? <laughs> yeah. It's been Dude, that, that's like me because I, I will go to microwave something and as the timer's ticking down, I'll go do something else. And then forget and... about it. I then, yeah, frequently forget about it to, like, the point of the next day, because a lot of times, if I oh, forget God. about it, it's, like, it was 1 or 2 a.m., and I warmed something up to eat while, like, playing a game or reading or watching a movie or whatever, and then I go straight to bed after that, <laughs> and so I'd, I'd warm something up, I'd go do a thing, Forget and about it, bed, and the next day, you go to the then, microwave or something, and, oh! Yep. Oh! Yeah, there's, like, a there's like a piece of toast or a bagel or some sort of leftovers or a hot dog or something sitting in there. It's <laughs> just like, hey, dude, you forgot about me. <laughs> well, I better not forget my food. Anyway, thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week with more shenanigans and right more news. Right before Black Friday and the givings of the thanks and the yes. foods. And, and hopefully Sombra will be out on Overwatch by then because holy fuck, I wish she, she was out now. Oh, fuck. I thought she was. She's in the playtest server. Oh. In the playtest client, not the real live game. Got it. I'm oh, right. Go uh, one pudding. thing I did forget to mention. Uh, uh oh. On the 18th Pudding? of November, Overwatch is having a free weekend for PC, PS4, and Xbox owners. So oh, get shit, that. That's if right. Not, it'll last until the 21st, I think. I'm going to have to like sign up for that and download it in the yeah. afternoon, and then I won't be able to play it until Saturday. Do that, though. Do that. Because so, I'm going to be actually gone on the 18th. Uh, there's also yeah, do that. going on on the I remember something happening on the 21st too which is that like right after that weekend what the hell is happening after that I don't know oh, oh shit yeah we'll remember it bye everybody <laughs>